Welcome to the Creating High Performance Athletes podcast. I'm your host, Olympian Jonathan Edwards. Let's get started. All right. Hey, everybody. It's Jonathan. Welcome to another weekly Facebook Q&A. If you're listening to me on iTunes or on Spotify now or Stitcher or Deezer, where the hell Deezer is, I don't know, but I'm, I'm live on Deezer. I'm big in Japan. So, hey, I just wanted to uh, welcome everybody to another um, another episode. So today we're going to be talking about how to deal with negative coaches. Dave Nord, Carmine Massey, good to see you guys. Welcome. Uh, really, um, uh, really excited to kind of dig into this one today. A lot of good stuff on the go. Howie, howdy, Jonathan Redford, good to see you. Robert Fegg, where are you in the world, Robert Fegg? Um, uh, this is about you, Robert Fegg, by the way. This is all about negative coaches, Robert Fegg, coach. So I'm just, yeah, no, totally kidding. Um, thank you, Dave uh, Nord, for that comment. appreciate it. Take care. I'll talk to you guys soon. Tagging for later. I love that. Uh, so a lot of great stuff kind of going on this week. Um, I've, I've been doing a lot of work, a lot of content, doing a lot of videos, really kind of stepping it up for 2020. Um, if you haven't already, so if you go to YouTube and you look for um, athletespecific.com, I'm posting videos now there once a week, a little bit more in depth, a little bit more, um, a little bit more movie style. I'm kind of enjoying this kind of more movie theme. I'm going to do more of that. Um, and so, um, uh, Robert Fagan Oberhoff. Yes. Um, uh, and so if you head on over to YouTube and go to uh, search for athletespecific.com, do me a favor and subscribe, tell your athletes to subscribe. Um, I am picking content there that I, that I'm doing every week. Uh, one of the ones that I'm working on right now is if you call yourself elite, you're probably not. So, um, one of the things that uh, that happens, especially in lacrosse, in the lacrosse community, is we have teams where we have club teams, and then they'll have an elite team, right? And so uh, I always I always laugh at that a little bit because um, so I'm working on the video right now. So head on over there, subscribe, share it. Would you? Uh, I, I'm just trying to get to um, uh, get as much traction over there as possible. I certainly would appreciate it. Um, and so today uh, I'm talking about a pretty interesting topic, which is how to deal with negative coaches. You know, sometimes athletes run into situations where they are. Are, um, they're working with a, with a coach who just, for any number of reasons, is not positive, right? And and I think you know one of the things that 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 happens is that first I'll start with this. I think as parents, uh, parents ask too much of their coach, right? It, you know, it, it's interesting. If, if your kid was uh, struggling in math class, you'd probably just be worried about the math portion of the class and, and you might be worried a little bit about kind of how the teacher might be teaching it but for the most part you just be worried about the technical side of things but when it comes to sport we want our coaches to be like technically proficient we want them to be tactically proficient we want them to have an understanding of um of physical development you know strength conditioning mobility stability you know, flexibility, all this stuff. Uh, and then we also want them to wrap that in the most incredible customer service package possible, right? All while dealing with 20 other kids, right? And I think that's unfair. I think what's happened over, over time is, is that we've, um, now let me back up personally as a coach, I, I want to be like, I want to be able to do that for all my athletes. I want to be able to morph, to a certain personality that is going to affect every kid, and I get frustrated when I don't reach a kid uh, on 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 a team, you know, for whatever reasons. You know, maybe, um, you know, I've had I've had I've been on a team where I've coached where I've been the big white coach, <laughs> and this kid's from a dark family, like literally, um, you know, to, to to and I was like, that's so unfair. <laughs> But this kid had had an experience in the past where, you know, he had had this big white coach, and then the guy was mean to him. And so, yeah, I can't overcome that. So let's let's um, let's uh, let's keep that uh, within reason. But but the point is, is I think a lot of a lot of we're asking so much of our coaches that sometimes it's a little unfair. Um, but but there are coaches where they're they don't believe in your kid. They don't, they don't, they don't think your kid is going to make it. Uh, they've never seen a kid like yours make it. Um, they're grumpy. They're overworked. They're going through a divorce. They have an alcohol problem. Um, they, um, they, they aren't, they aren't paid enough. Um, they've got another athlete on the team who is 
their focus, like they, they think that that kid's going to make it. And so, and your, your athlete needs more, right? I explain this, um, I explain this visual as like, you know, your coach has abilities too, and it's like a bubble and either you're in that bubble or you're pressing up against the edges, either too far ahead, you need more, or you're pressing, you're, you're pulling them back and you're pulling the bubble in the wrong direction. So whatever causes it, the coach can be, um, negative. Now there's, 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 overtly negative, like what I experienced when I was, you know, in high school and, and, and running up against coaches who were like, no, you're never a kid from Massachusetts never became an all American, uh, especially a goalie, uh, right. You're, oh, you're too short. Oh, you're too this, you're too that, like whatever. There's, there's coaches who will like get up in your face and they like, you suck. Um, I think of that's that scene in uh, happy Gilmore where there's the heckler, uh, going, Hey Gilmore, you suck, you jackass. Like, and it's just a funny clip, but, um, but I want, uh, you know, for whatever reason that coach is, has a negative attitude, um, towards your, your athlete. I, I want to start by saying a lot of coaches, not all, but a lot of them suffer from incredibly low self-esteem and, and, any challenge to their authority uh, creates a back, like a backlash, right? So, so I encourage all my all my families to be proactive with their coaches and to reach out to their coaches. But, but imagine, imagine if you will, like for a lot of coaches, again, not all, but some, uh, this is the top of their sport for them. Right, like you, 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 you competed in a sport. You love the sport. You want to stay in the sport. Well, the only natural place to go is into coaching, and then you get further up the ranks, and and you're a coach. You might be an assistant coach, or you might be head coach, um, and 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 that's that's awesome. Like that's that's it. And and some coaches do so well with that. Like there's some on this right now that are phenomenal at it. But there's some coaches who get up there and they're so nervous about ever losing that job that they fear anybody who seems to be contradicting what it is they're doing, right? And so there's an interesting principle that some of you may know, some of you may not know, but it's called the Peter Principle, right? And it's based on a book that was written back in 1969 um, by a guy named Raymond, um, Raymond Hall. No, sorry, uh, Lawrence Peter developed the, um, developed the, the, the concept and it's from it's it's in management in business, um, but basically what ends up happening w- was that people in any sort of hierarchy and sport is a total hierarchy, right? You have teams, you have captains on teams, you have uh, you have then you have assistant captains, and then you have coaches, you have assistant coaches, you have coaches, and so on. And so the Peter principle states that basically people rise to a level of their incompetence. <laughs> and I love I love that like people rise to their level of incompetence. And then what happens is that everybody hates them and they leave. Um, I worked uh, a couple of years ago with a um, a tennis program, and um, and I saw this coming. The head coach, phenomenal technically, like really good technically. Kids loved him, loved him, right? And he could teach, like he could really teach, and it was awesome to see. But he was put into a position to be now a program director. And that requires a whole other level of bandwidth that a lot of coaches don't have. Long story short, this coach ended up getting fired, which is really disappointing because what should have happened was this coach should have been like basically relegated to head coach, right? Like head coach, not program director. And then because what ends up happening at program director level was that he he wanted to just be with the kids. He wanted to be coaching. That's his love. That's his passion. Um, and, and again, the parents loved him too. But the, the manager of this facility where it was kind of overseeing this guy turfed him, which was just stupid, um, in my opinion, just absolutely stupid. And, and so, but the Peter principle is something that affects a lot of coaches, right? And so, so coaches can be really good technically and they can be really good tactically, they they if they're it's a bonus if they're really good physically they understand physical development but if they don't that's that's okay you can get that from a strength and conditioning coach that's that's evolved since like 2000 the world of strength and conditioning has totally evolved into a separate entity uh, to the point where some of those strength and conditioning coaches are like physical therapists right as well like it's it's just awesome right but that so that's that's the physical ability side of it but but your coach is typically not trained 
nor should we expect them to be trained in customer service. <laughs> okay, so, so what happens much of the time is the conflict that parents and athletes have with a coach has less to do with what that coach knows technically or tactically and more about how they present it, right? More the package that it's wrapped in. You know, I, I think back to when I was really young and um, I don't know if any of you guys have this experience. You can leave me a comment if you did. But you know when you were young and you had to take like an aspirin, right? Uh, probably this is more appropriate to like people my age. But I remember like there was no like liquid aspirins or things to take if you had a fever. But so I remember my mom would give me an aspirin stuffed inside like a caramel, like a soft caramel. And I would eat that. And, and sure enough, you'd, you'd chew on it and you'd get to the aspirin, but the, the caramel overrun, overwhelmed the, the aspirin taste, right? You could still taste it a little bit, but it was like, oh, it was more caramel than aspirin and he got the aspirin down and then he felt better, right? And so it's kind of like coaching, right? You know, your coach is there to help your athlete get better, right? Now, if the goals aren't clear, right? If the goals aren't clear coming in, then instantly you have a problem right? Instantly you have conflict. But when the, so, so sometimes coaches are presented in a, in a light where this is the be all and end all. Like you finally got to work with this guy and whatever they tell you, whether you feel it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter. That coach is like on this massive pedestal and that's cool. But I think today's generation of athletes, uh, they want to know why, especially the girls, like the girls want to know, why are we doing this? Like, why, why, why? And when a coach can be clear about that, then, then great. That's okay. But if a coach is unclear about it uh, and just say it's like my way or the highway, well, then you have conflict, right? And we don't, we don't want that. So the, the interesting thing here is that when I believe that every coach, every, every coach should work with the inventory that they have, meaning the athletes. And there's some coaches that just don't want to do that, right? There's, there's, I know some coaches in, in a couple sports where, uh, I, and I don't realize I don't know why they're still in the same position, to be honest. Um, but they're always wishing they had better athletes, right? That they would have better results if they just had better athletes. And the truth is, is that that coach is there to take that athlete and make them better. And that takes a lot of work, especially if they're working with a lot of athletes, right? You know, it takes a lot of mental bandwidth to to work with your best athlete and then work with your worst athlete, and and put them in a situation to get them better. Right, but what happens a lot of times is the co- the athlete or the parent or the athlete gets offended by the advice the coach gives them. So if the coach says like, "Listen, I don't think you're going to make it right now," right? L- let me rephrase this. If a coach tells you like, "No, you suck. You're never going to make it," that's one level, right? That's one layer. <laughs> like that's a ten <laughs> on a scale of one to ten, right? You suck. You're never going to make it. That's like maybe that's like an eleven. It's off the scale, right? But a coach who comes at the athlete and says, "Listen, I don't think you're going to make it, and here's why." <laughs> Now we have feedback, right? Now we're wrapping that aspirin in that caramel, right? <laughs> right? Now it's not like a, it's not like an attack on your on your character. It's an attack on your ability. And then it's like, well, how are we going to make that work, coach? Like, how are we going to improve this? Right? So, so I believe that coaches should not be trying to predict the future. Now, every coach, listen, coaches have if they've been coaching in a sport for a really long time, they have some experience, right? They have some going like, well, you know, listen, I've never seen an athlete like you make it or like your kid make it. Well, okay. What, what if you did, like if you did see an athlete like him, make it, what do you think needs to happen? Well, here's what needs to happen. And now you lay out a plan, right? I, I've seen coaches who try to predict the future and um, they, they, say like, oh, a kid like you's never going to make it. Here's an interesting example. I'm just trying to get one from my experience. Um, uh, in the sport of luge, which I was a big part of, or, or I should say it was a big part of my life, not I was a big part of it. It was, It's still going on. Um, I had my time. One of the things that happens is that there's always a predictor of like, okay, an athlete this size doesn't make it too tall, too short, too fat, too skinny, like whatever. Um, there's a lot of twos that go on. But what tends to happen is there's, there's an athlete who finally comes out and and does break that mold. Um, and 
I remember back when I competed, there was two athletes, Georg Hackel and Marcus Prock were the best in the world. Two very different athletes physically. One was, you know, Marcus Prock was like 6'1", I think, probably about 200 pounds. Uh, Georg Hackel was like 5'7", 5'7 um, and a half, and like a buck 90, buck 85. Um, two different athletes physically at the top of their game. In the meantime, the athlete that came up behind him was about 5'9", 5'10", um, a buck 75, buck 80, uh, was Armin Zagor of Italy. So at any one point in time, there are people saying like, oh, you can't make it if you're that tall. Like, um, like people would say like, oh, Marcus Proc is not going to, not going to be very good, very good because he's too long. And on certain tracks, that's not an advantage. Whereas Hackle would have an advantage. But Marcus Proc went on to win like, I don't know, six overall World Cup titles. Um, whereas Hackle won more Olympics, uh, medals. But, but my point is that coaches try to get into um, predicting the future, and one of the problems that's not the it's not the coach's fault, but the programs that they're involved in. There's usually funding issues in, involved. Like I remember being involved in Canada, they had this program called Own the Podium, and this was leading up to the Vancouver Olympics in 2010. You know, it was all about funding, and it was and they would go to these programs, they like and go to the coaches. Who do you think is going to medal in 2010? And so a coach is naturally put in this method of of, of of predicting the future, which really hurts everybody. It hurts the coach, it hurts the athlete. Um, and my favorite, one of my favorite quotes is, man plans and God laughs, right? I love that quote. Because I don't care what sport you're involved in, there's an athlete who's totally broken the mold and has succeeded where others who were told that they would succeed have failed, right? And so, so if your coach is being negative to you, it's usually based on their knowledge of, of athletes they'd seen go before them, but also their belief in you. And the belief in you comes, the belief in the athlete comes from usually the attitude that the athlete brings to the, to the situation. Um, I worked with a program a number of years ago, and there were three somewhat talented athletes, but who had just the worst attitudes. Like they just felt like everything was out to get them. They had total victim mentality. They were blaming everything about their lack of success. Um, and yet their physical ability lacked, their technical ability lacked, their tactical ability lacked. They didn't want to listen to anybody. So what they perceived as negative coaching or a coach with a negative attitude was just a coach that was so damn frustrated with these these three that, that you know, it, it's like, what more can we tell you? So... So it goes both ways. How an athlete perceives what the coach is telling them is one thing. Um, and, and, but again, a coach can do, probably do a little better to maybe package it in a way. But to me, it's not about that at all. It's about the relationship the athlete and the coach has on this journey, right? And the honesty that, that the, um, the coach has with the athlete, but also the self-awareness that that athlete develops, right? So when the coach says, hey, listen, you're, you're overweight, you're weak, you know, and, and instead of the athlete getting offended or the parents getting offended, it's like, well, according to this coach, those are things that you need to work on. Are you going to work on them or not? Because if you're not, then you're just going to piss off the coach. So the coach isn't being negative in that case. The coach is just giving you what needs that, what they feel you need to do to improve, and it's up to you to, to, to do to apply those things, but also to do it in a way where there's some, there's some feedback, right? You know, it's one thing for a coach to 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 come at your athlete and say like this is what you need to work on. And that may seem negative to you, but it's another thing to say, okay, listen, we're, we're going to, we agree to, we agree we're going to work on this. And then in six months time or, or three months time, 90 days, we're going to come back and we're going to assess like, is this improving, right? Is this quality improving? Because your athlete is literally the CEO, right? They're, they're the CEO, but let's put it this way. There's a lot of companies that have a CEO who's, not really there uh, on all like facets. So there's a COO, right? A, a chief operating officer. And they're the one that's kind of in charge. And a lot of times parents end up being the COO because the CEO, the, the athlete, they don't know what they don't know yet, right? And so as the adult in the room, the, the, the parent needs to take a position where they're like, all right, listen, uh, 
you are really good at this thing. Whether you're a skier, a luge athlete, lacrosse player, a bobsledder, an equestrian, you're really good at that. Um, okay, so now we need to go over here. And so it's imagine like a, it's a store and the store makes pies, right? And so the athlete is the pie maker. Doesn't mean the athlete's really good at accounting. Doesn't mean the athlete's really good at, um, you know, system management, uh, customer service, things along those lines. Um, and so the CEO and the COO, they, on this journey of becoming a really good athlete, right, they're going to hire people to make that happen. Now, what happens a lot, what flips this around in sports a lot of times is that you, the athlete just gets on an, another team. and they're, But imagine in case of, instead of being just put on a team, you've actually hired that team and you've hired that coach. So what would you do with that coach? Well, one, you, you'd find out what that coach is all about. Right, you'd find out what. Let's say you're, you're you know, the, you own this pie shop. The the athlete makes the pies. The CEO, COO, is there helping this this store grow. And you hire this outside. It's a consultant. So in this case, the consultant is your coach, right? And you've hired that consultant to give you information to get you further along the way, right? How can I succeed here, coach? What do we need to do to improve? And now the coach gives you advice, gives you feedback. And now you say, okay, we're going to try this for 90 days and we're going to see how this goes, right? At the end of 90 days, you're going to review. This is where a lot of relationships with coaches just totally break down because there's none of this. There's none of this, right? There's none of this like, okay, what do you want to have happen? What do you want to, what do you want to improve? How are we going to go about it? All right. You know, I say this jokingly, but it's really kind of true is most parents and athletes who have problems with their coaches are usually the athletes that need the biggest kick in the ass. Fair? So rarely does the co does the athlete who even even the athletes who are who every team has a, a two or three athletes that probably should be on a better team <coughs> or at least pardon me or at least feel that they should be on a better team. And therefore they think that okay this coach is a jerk or the coach isn't helping them or coach isn't, you know, doing what they need to be doing. Having some sort of awareness of that going into a season is really valuable, right? And, and this is what, you know, so this is what I want you to take away from this talk today. One is you got to meet your coach halfway. It would be great if the coach opened the door and just said, okay, I'm going to meet with every parent at the beginning of the season. We're going to like all this stuff. A lot of times parent coaches will do that with an athlete if they do it, but they rarely do it with a parent. And I think nowadays we need to really align all three facets there, the coach, the parent, and the athlete, right? So that everybody's on the same page because I know as a coach, I want what I'm telling my athlete to then be reinforced by the parent at home. And if it's not, I want to know. I want to understand like what's up, why, all right? And we might agree to disagree, but, but because that doesn't always happen, you as the parent need to meet and need to encourage you and your athlete to meet the coach halfway or sometimes you might even have to go further, right? If the coach is a complete ass, you got to go 75% or 90%. I don't care. But you got to have a relationship there, all right? So that's step number one is to meet them halfway. As soon as you know you're going to be working with a coach or a new coach or um, a new program, bridge that gap, right? We're in the, you know, all... Developing athletes is all about the people business, right? And we want to we wanna get there, all right? So step number two, um, understand what your coach's expectations are about everything, okay? As much as you can, right? Like, all right, when, you know, what happens when the bus leaves? Um, what happens, you know, what, uh, um, what do you expect kids to do for, uh, I mean, it's funny, my brain is like totally overwhelmed with all these things right now. Um, but not, not enough clarity to list it, but like this, like when do you show up? When's the bus going to leave? When do you, when should we show up for practice? Um, what, um, uh, you know, think little things like, do we bring a water bottle or not? Um, uh, what's your expectations of out, outside of practice? Like, what should we be doing? Um, you know, should we be journaling? Should we be, uh, and these are all things that I teach actually in my, my athlete br blueprint. Um, uh, Jeff, I just saw your comment. Hold on. Um, so 
there's so whatever the expectations are. Also, according to like let's say your athlete in their position, what is the coach's understand philosophy on technique? Right, that's that's a big one, and I, I don't think I've clarified this as well because I know I have a lot of people on here from a lot of different sports, right? And so, um, you know, your athlete may have been taught a certain way, and and now by one coach, and now you're now on a new program, and that new coach, that new coach may actually disagree with that other coach. Like ideally, your entire program is aligned, but this doesn't always happen. All right, but but whatever it is, like let's say your your athlete up until this point has been taught a certain way, and now this next coach is expecting a different level of whatever. You got to know, right? You got to know that stuff, and and the sooner you know, the sooner you 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 can get your athlete's head around it, the better, right? Um, I've seen this happen with a, a couple different athletes in a, in a couple different sports where. Uh, they had been taught technically one way, and that n- the next coach despise that technique well that's negative right and this young athlete's like well what the hell i've just i've never learned this but if if you come in that situation go like okay the coach is expecting now this level of technique well if the coach doesn't want to teach it that's a problem um you know so so yes it would be up to the coach to uh, here okay let me back up figure skating uh, I've worked with a number of figure skaters, and this happens a lot because there's a ton of egos in figure skating coaches, right? So I, I don't care if you're not a figure skater, just hear me out here. Figure skating coaches have like egos like out the, like, yeah, it's huge. So, but a lot of, the, what happens a lot of times is that parents will see that the coach their athlete is currently working with isn't as shiny and glossy as that other coach. Maybe it's an Olympic coach. Right, and so the parents naturally think, well, I've got to get my 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 son, my daughter, to that coach, and then it'll all be better. The problem is, the further you move up the food chain, the less that coach wants to deal with the the customer service side of coaching. They just want the result, right? The reason why they're coach they're coaching Olympians is because one, they have this aura right around them, and so what happens is sometimes the, the parent, the athlete, makes decides to make the switch. Or they're gonna they're gonna leave their long term co- time coach, maybe that brought them up from a really young age, and now they're going to um, they're going to uh, head over to something uh, this new glossy coach. Well, then they get to the new glossy coach, and the glossy coach does nothing but but downplay what it is their old coach um, did, and basically bashes the coach, bashes the athlete, and the young athlete's like, "What the hell is this? I don't get it." Right. So that's not cool, but that can happen. Right, so you've got to understand that new coach's expectations of everything as soon as you can, so that you can prepare, so that your athlete has the best chance of success going in. Okay, here's a tough one, um, and this is really, really tough. So Jeff writes, uh, difficult for coach to fight athlete and parent. Need everyone on the same page. Yes, Robert writes to have a good relationship with your athlete. You got to first establish a good relationship with their parents. Yeah, exactly. Um, so here's one. And this can come off as being totally confrontational. So you have to position this really, really well. The idea is this, is asking a coach what they're not good at. Now, I know when I say that, and when you hear that, you're probably thinking like, you're not going to get a clear answer. And you're probably right. But one of the things that I try to do proactively with my athletes is let them know, here's some things that I'm not really good at. And I'll tell them, I'll, you know, I'll tell them some personal things like, you know, when I'm tired, I'm a grumpy SOB. I'll be completely honest with you. So if I'm having a rough day, I'm going to try to be as consistent as possible with you. But there's going to be days where like I'm human and I'm tired and I'm worn out and I'm bummed and I may get upset at you, but I'm not upset at you. I'm, at ups- I'm, gonna, I'm upset at something else through you. Okay. Now that takes a lot of balls for a coach to say, and I don't think a lot of coaches would do that because what most coaches will say, like, I'm fantastic at everything. Um, but th- so, and, and I've seen that happen. Like a lot of athletes that hire me, you know, one of the things that we have to do is we have to kind of help the athlete dissect what their coach is really good at and what they're not. Um, and that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of mental, it takes a lot of thinking, right? And so, so, but it's worth asking a coach, like coach, listen, what are some things you, 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 you're not good at, or you don't like to do, or you don't like to coach or, um, and, 
sometimes just that opening will develop a little bit of an understanding, a common ground between you and your coach where they, um, you know, now, you, now you're, you're kind of opening up and you're like, we're, we're both on the same page here. We both want to win. We both want to get better. But coach, what are you not good at? Because you know everything that I'm not good at as the athlete or what you think I'm not good at. But, but hey, what, what, what are some things that you're not good at? Um, and a, I think a good coach will open up and he'll tell you. All right, or she'll tell you, all right? But don't be confrontational about it. That's the big one here. Um, you know, n- number four here is, is a coach, uh, a coach who's negative to you to, or to your athlete may just be trying to motivate you, but they lack other skills, okay? Uh, interpersonal skills are some of the most difficult things to learn. And I don't, I'm not, I'm not saying that I know them all, um, I'm, I think I'm more aware of most now, but a lot of coaches who work with, um, work with kids all day, uh, or young people as they age, like, so let's say the coach is like in their forties and then their fifties, but they're still working with the same product every day, the same teenagers or, um, uh, or, or, or 20 year olds. Right. So, so the coach though, never develops this like more adult way of talking. I, I remember I had a coach, I worked with a number of years ago and a uh, coach was get, was dealing with some depression and some things like that. And so they went to see um, a therapist and the therapist was like, tell me who you work with on a daily basis. And the coach was like, well, I deal with eight year old kids and I deal with teenagers and I, I, I deal with 20 year olds and I, I've got a couple 30 year olds and I deal with all their parents. Their parents range in age from 30 to foot to six to 75. Um, and then I deal with sponsors and I deal with uh, corporate people and I deal with, um, uh, and, and, and they, she just laid out like this laundry list and the, the, the therapist was like, that's incredible. Cause most people are dealing with like one type of person, you know, they might be dealing with adults and other adults. Like you go to work every day, but this coach, what they uncovered though, for this coach was that primarily this coach was working with young kids and his tone and his 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 interpersonal skills with the adults lacked. And I don't know if the, for the parents on there, I don't know if you've ever had this experience where maybe you met like the the principal at your kid's middle school and they talked to you just like they've talked to those 10 and 12 year old kids all day. You ever had that? Like I love that. It's super funny. Um and so one of the things that um uh Sometimes your coach, their default way of motivating is to put you down, which seems weird, I know, but it, but that's like their only tool in their tool bag. And you've got to recognize that. You, you've got to empower your athlete to know that, listen, that might be their only way of getting to you, right? That might be their only way, their only, their only skill set to help you understand. Um, but if your athlete isn't aware of that, then coach just is an ass, Right? Um, and so be, because again, there's no relationship there. The, the athletes default is that the coach hates me. Coach doesn't want me to succeed. Coach thinks I suck. And then your athlete takes that home and they're like, you know, you know, they're, they're in a funk because of what coach said to them, but really coach only has one tool and that's to be negative. Right. And so, um, I shared this story today on my other podcast for my, my lacrosse families. I'll share it here now. Um, I, so I, I played lacrosse in addition to being an Olympian in the sport of luge, my other sport was field lacrosse. And, and I was at one, I was at Thayer Academy in Braintree, Massachusetts till my grade 11 year. And I finished my grade 11 year. And then I transferred to, because I wanted to be an all American, a high school American. And I wanted to play in college that wasn't going to happen at Thayer. So I transferred to Lawrence. I took an extra year. So I, I did grade 11 again and I did grade 12 and I was an all American. That first grade 11 year, my coach, Jeff, was super excited to finally have a, a, a decent goalie on his team. And he had high hopes for that season. The team wasn't very strong, but he's excited that, and he knew what my goals were. He knew I wanted to be an All-American. And I remember the first couple games, you know, I'm making passes that he never really had a goalie make before. And I'm pushing the envelope and I'm making things, trying to make things happen. And, you know, a couple times I make a mistake. And Jeff's default to me was to yell at me from the sideline. And uh, if you can picture the field at Lawrence, like was there was this massive hill that um, led up to the school. And the hill was probably like 40 yards long. 
And so there's bleachers and then there's big grass field and then there's a parking lot at the top so all the parents can park their cars and, and, and watch over. So there's all these people. And if I made a bad play, um, Je- Jeff would yell at me. And so I, I, I took the time at one point to talk to Jeff and be like, listen, you can't do that to me. Like I, of all your athletes, I'm the, I'm, I've got the toughest inner critic. I've got the biggest goals. I got the biggest dreams. Don't think for a minute that when I miss, miss a pass, I don't know that I missed it. I'm beating myself up. I don't need you to do it as well. So from that point on, we totally shifted and we then had a really productive relationship. And then I was an all American and a division one recruit and all that stuff worked out. But I, I share that story because it, 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 it shows, you know, Jeff was pushing me as an athlete to be better. And Robert writes an, a, a, an interesting comment here, which, which says, sometimes you have to break an athlete to make an athlete, but that doesn't have to be negative. It just needs to be communicated appropriately. Totally. Now, Robert comes from a world where competition is king. And in North America, we have a lot of athletes coming up with, they don't have that competitive environment they they you know a lot of times in north america we think a coach is being negative but really what a coach is doing is just driving us like i've seen over the years i've seen north american athletes fail with european coaches because they can't deal with the 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 approach and the interesting thing there is that english is the second language for some, for some of those coaches not all uh, well it's a second language but some are more proficient than others right um, and, but if we take the emotion out of it, right, if we just take the emotion out of it and we just ask the coach, what do I need to improve on? And then the athlete takes that again with no emotion and says, okay, coach says I need to work on this, 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 and this, I'm going to do it. And then they go do it. Great. It's at that point, then are we improving? Or are we not improving? It's much more subjective. Or, sorry. It's a much more, um, uh, concrete answer. Lori writes, um, uh, it's the same in a classroom. It's why educational psychology and sports psychology function well together. True. She also writes, wouldn't it be more beneficial to understand how to mesh what an athlete already knows with what you're trying to teach them? Yes. Uh, so again, this is a, Lori, that's a great question. So coaches are coming with their experience, right? And, but again, it's a coach needs to be a toolbox, right? Not just a hammer or a screwdriver or a drill, right? They need to be a toolbox. But if an athlete understands that sometimes the coach they're working with is more hammer than, than screwdriver, <laughs> right? Is more drill than, um, whatever putty, <laughs> whatever. Um, but if everybody just kind of knows on the same page, like, okay, this is what the athlete's good at. This is what they're not good at. And now this coach needs to help develop that because if the coach isn't going to be able to develop that, then it's not a really good relationship to be in. Right. I've seen this happen, um, again, using that figure skating analogy where the uh, athlete, you know, just had, had not been taught technically some things that next coach didn't know how to teach it, just expected the athlete to have it by the time they got to him. Uh, the, that coach was so frustrated. Two reasons why. One, he couldn't teach it, but also he's, he wasn't really aware of that, the fact that he couldn't really teach it. And it was a frustrating, it was a wasted year for the athlete. The athlete then ended up having to leave for another coach. They were pissed. Parents were pissed. It was a waste of a year. Um, the athlete never really rebounded from that lost year. Uh, and so it was, a, it was a disappointing situation. But going in, if, the, if everybody had been a little bit more educated about like what was going on and who could do what, it had been a different story, okay? Um, number five, don't be confrontational at all times. I know I've said this a couple times, but number, I'm going to say it again. If you get ahead of all this stuff, you should be fine. Again, I, I use the kind of the entrepreneur, the CEO example of like, if you're going to hire a consultant, um, you would vet that consultant out as much as you possibly could. And doesn't mean you're going to work with them. Yes or no. You might actually decide to work with a consultant, even though they may lack in certain areas, but at least you know what they lack. Okay. Right. So that, that's really, really important. So that coach on that next team you're going to be on the next program you're going to be with. It's like, all right, listen, you know, talk to other athletes. I, I worked with this, this past week, I was dealing with a family who have a division one athlete and the coach. So this, this athlete was recruited by this coach. This athlete was vetted by this coach. This athlete is scholarshiped by this program. The coach has turned out to be a complete 
ass. And I'm just like, you didn't know that beforehand? Like you couldn't have found that out? Right? Like this, because this, because now what's come out of this is the athlete's like, oh yeah, this coach is always like that. The t- I'm, I'm finding out the coach is always like this. Really? You know, it's like, how did you, how did you, mi- how did you miss that? Right? But, but what can happen is sometimes everybody's so excited about the opportunity that people are too worried to ask questions. And, and, and granted that in some sports, like I think of, I think of a lot of smaller Olympic sports, you know, luge, bobsled, uh, skeleton, um, skiing, snowboarding, there's only one path, right? It gets really, it gets finer, it gets smaller and smaller and you're, you know, you're only going to be dealing with one coach. <coughs> um, so that's where more of these skills is even more, it's not like you're going from one school to another, right? It's not like you're transferring from one university to the next. You, have, you don't have that option. That's where these skills are even more and more important because the coaches really, really need, they need to be working technically. They need to be working tactically. The interpersonal stuff, if, if the athlete can come in more empowered, then the coach doesn't have to worry about those things as much, right? And then everybody's happy, okay? Um, and that's a big thing to, um, uh, to learn. It's all about interpersonal skills. And I want to recommend three books, okay? Three books. If you're listening to me this long, you, got th- you deserve this. They're all by a guy named Robert Greene. And they're big books. They're like a freaking Bible, all right? One is The 48 Laws of Power, okay? The other one is Mastery, okay? And the third Robert Greene book is called The Laws of Human Nature, now, here's a little tip. You can get the audio books on YouTube and download them because these are big books. They're super thick, but they're super well-researched and they've totally changed my life as a human being. I wish I knew. They came out, I think the first book came out in 99. The others came out in the 2000s. Everybody should read these books. Mom, dad, coach, athlete, to understand what everybody's dealing with. The mastery book is phenomenal because listen, here's the thing. Your athlete is not trying to be good at football or lacrosse or luge or skiing or bobsled or, or archery or underwater basket weaving. It's they're trying to master the sport as a whole, right? They're trying to master this environment. And if people just, if the athlete focused more on mastery and less about, um, and less about uh, how this is making me feel. And, and, uh, you know, I think of, Ask Pat from the old SNL skits, which is like, eh. so some athletes go about this. Some parents do too. It's like, no, listen, we're, we're all just trying to win. So the more, more emotion we can take out of it, the more we can understand like why people do what they do and how we can master this sport, not just be good at it, but master it, then a lot of these problems go away, okay? So here's the deal. I want you to, you can message me, you can post a comment, if you're watching this on Facebook or if you're on YouTube or whatnot, um, or you can DM me, tell me your story. You know, tell me, and you can keep it neutral if you want. Um, it, probably better to message me, I guess, than it can be super honest. But tell me your story. And tell me, like, what your athlete's dealing with. Maybe some coaches that they're dealing with. Um, and and just let, do this in a way that we can kind of maybe continue the conversation. Um, and then... Um, and then I can maybe morph some future episodes uh, around these topics as well. But, you know, this the coach-athlete-parent is a relationship. If it's antagonistic, it doesn't work really well, all right? Um, and the further you go up the food chain, the more you get profesh- pro, right? Not professional like you're a professional hockey player or a professional football player. You can be on a national team. You can be on a travel team. The more pro your athlete is, the and the better, you, the more pro you are as a parent. The less of this you have to worry about. There's less negativity. There's less um, emotional baggage, right? There's less emotional hurt, right? Um, but it 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 relies on your athlete becoming a pro, and. You, your athlete can start becoming a pro like now because it's all habits. It's all just habits, right? But I want you to take away from this today that negative coaches are usually a sign 
that your athlete is not yet good enough. All right. And instead of placing blame on that negative coach, as much as we would want him or her to wrap that aspirin in a caramel, like that story I told at the very beginning, beginning, the less we demand of our coaches to have to be all of that, right? The technical coach, the tactical coach, the physical coach, and oh yeah, can you do it, um, you know, wrapped in a package that comes across like Betty White, right? If the, the, we, 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 need, we don't need that, right? The more your athlete can work without that, the more success they'll have, the sooner they'll have it, and the more success you'll have uh, on this journey, okay? All right, so listen, everybody, thank you for watching, as always. I hope this helped. If it helped, leave me a, a thumbs up, a like, a comment. Uh, if there's a topic you want me to, to cover in a future episode, please leave that. Down, leave that. Um, and listen, share that. Share this with your athlete. Um, share this with your coach. Um, find that common ground. If you're in a contentious relationship with your coach, I encourage you to reach out to them and say, hey, listen, you know, the way you're doing this is hurting my feelings. What can we do about this, right? Or, you know, and one, the, it, there's primarily your answer right there. Don't worry about your feelings so much. But secondly, like just, just create, bridge that gap. Realize that you're all working for the same stuff. Get on the same page. Realize that everybody's doing the best with what they know at the time, right? And then from there, you can move forward. And I can't wait to hear your success. All right, guys, listen, thanks so much. And I'll see you guys next week. Cheers, bye.